Кордей и тема доклада «Политическая эволюция и революция. Сетевой анализ трансформации власти в Судане в ходе арабской весны». Пожалуйста. Uh, good afternoon, and um, I'm going to be talking in general about some of the work that we've been doing on conflict, and this is work by myself and my students and my group out at, um, out at Carnegie Mellon in the U.S. The way we, the approach that we take is to look at networks, to look at networks from a very dynamic perspective. We're interested in not just who talks to whom and how they're related, but how those networks evolve through space and through time, and how as individuals' behavior changes in those networks, it affects social outcomes like you know, revolution in particular states. The approach that we take is very data-driven, and in fact, we use a lot of different kinds of data. Today, we'll be seeing results using data from newspapers like Lexis, uh, Nexus, online data, as well as data that we've gathered through tweets. The approach that we take is now called a rapid ethnographic assessment. Our goal when we started the project was to be able to do what a brilliant ethnographers and anthropologists do when they go into the field, but, take, but where they spend 20 years to gather a massive de detail on how the organizations and how the country operates. We wanted to be able to do it using news data and, again, uh, Twitter data, and be able to do it in a few weeks. To that end, we built a lot of technologies for letting you do that. And the technologies that we've developed and used include things that let you pull out networks from texts using text mining and machine learning, uh, network analytic tools, uh, including new ones for new metrics for dealing with networks in space and time, and then, of course, simulation techniques. The first project I'll describe to you is the work that we did on the Sudan. The Sudan is a very interesting country. In fact, it probably should not be a country, and it no longer is a single country. One of the things that we did was we collected data for over 12 years, since 2000, collecting data from news articles and so on, as well as ethnographic uh, writings by anthropologists, as well as maps. And we processed all of those to try to look at why is conflict occurring, what can be done to stop it, who are the political actors, and so on. The data that we have includes half a million articles drawn from LexisNexis and the Sudan Tribune Review, again, along with the writings of others. We processed these automatically and pulled up all of the actors, the organizations, the locations, the resources of, for various activities that were going on, as well as the political arguments. We took this information and then analyzed it, and like any good network analyst, we ran things like the centralities, degree centrality, between us, eigenvector, et cetera, and said, who are our key actors? Now, the first thing we did was look at this across all years at once. And when you do that, not surprisingly, you see Omar Bashir as being the most important actor. Omar Bashir, the president of North Sudan, is basically shows up all over the place. Now, over the course of these 10 years' worth of data, one of the interesting things that happens, of course, is that in 2005, you had the referendum to separate out southern Sudan into its own country. And then it, recently, they voted to actually maintain that uh, separation. During that time, Garang was going to become the uh, president of southern Sudan, the first, southern, the first president in 2005. But before that, he had been the vice president in uh, northern Sudan. And before he could become president, he died in a plane crash, at which point Taha and others took over. Now, when you're seeing these slides, the pink or the very light color, uh, make show up and looking like white, are actually the incumbents in northern Sudan. The red are the southern Sudanese. The green are members of uh, other people of interest from um, the areas of um, northern Africa, uh, northern Africa and the Mideast. And the yellow are part of the NATO and UN and US forces and the individuals and political actors who would be a part of this. As you can see here, again, more, uh, Bashir and Brown show up as being very important. Interestingly, though, you see under the between this factor a whole variety of individuals from a variety of different countries and different locations, all playing different roles. And we have found that the high variation in who the important actors in between this 
changes in fact by year because each year there are different topics of that become the focal topic, if you will, and each one of these is associated with a different focal topic. Among these individuals, you'll happen to notice, if you're a Rock, uh, Rolling Stones fan, you'll actually see Keith Richards. Most of the individuals up here, anyone who knew, who spent two minutes staying Sudan would have picked out. Keith Richards, they would have not. As a, uh, as a musician, his role here is really because he became one of the influential individuals in fighting for and arguing for the development of new codes of ethics and the, and the development and stopping of violence in Darfur. And so he became kind of a sounding board for the Darfurian uh, events. Because it's so easy to pick out the top actors, because they're not really interesting, that was all network analysis did for us. In the case of political elite in the complex situation, that wouldn't be enough. We then said, well, who are our secondary actors? Actors who are kind of behind the scenes, who are important, and then nonetheless um, going to be driving the force of change. So we came up with some new measures for things like the power behind the throne, or things like the latent leader. We also use a variation on between this um, to get at the notion of gatekeeper so we can get closer to a kind of a connects disconnected groups kind of idea. One of the things that you'll see there is that in fact no one in the Northern Sudan area shows up as being a late leader or in any of these secondary leadership possibilities. However, you do, have, and that has been interpreted by a variety of people in the UN and so on as a sign that in fact there is a, there is a um, lack of leadership in the Northern Sudan and it's a totalitarian area completely controlled by Bashir such that were he to be, you know, were he to die or to be removed from office, you would have, you could potentially have a complete collapse of that country. In contrast, Southern Su Sudan has a large number of, of actors who are in the emergent wings, all of whom are playing in, they're very cohesive and are all very di tightly connected and are actually building a Southern support. As we move on to other kinds of, of secondary actors, we see that, the in, again, in southern Sudan, particularly in the case with uh, these two individuals, we have individuals who are able to mobilize a lot of resources, a lot of goods and services. This mobilization idea is the idea that how much can you mobilize, how much social capital do, do, do you have? And we have many new metrics for that as well. One of the things that's important to note here is that, again, if we look at a lot of this, you mostly see actors from outside the country making it feel like a leaderless, re a re leaderless evolution. If we then were to say, well, what if we did a standard simulation game? We said, what if, uh, in fact, all the current top leaders were removed and you had to wipe the slate clean and start it over? What would happen? As you can see, there's no secondary leaders who will come into play in northern Sudan, again, suggesting a of uh, the total control of Bashir. In contrast, within southern Sudan, you have a large number of actors who are up and comers in that area. Now, this is still a rather static analysis, and we wanted to look at it more over time. So, what you see here is for a set of the 10 years, we're actually showing you the position of each individual in terms of their importance. In this case, we're using between this, but we could have used many other factors. As you look at this over time, you see that, in fact, Bashir's power has been growing. But Garang's, of course, because he died, was strong until he died, and then, of course, it went down. When you look at this particular uh, graph, and you can look at several others as well, what you find is that the usual suspects appear high on the chart, all the top leaders. Surprisingly, though, this person, Manawi, shows up. Manawi is an up-and-comer whose increasing rise in importance within the Sudan suggests that he is really the power, it is another way of looking at his power, and he's actually has Bashir's ear and is actually controlling things. When we talked to ethnographers in the region, none of them actually knew who he was. However, uh, the members of the UN did. And he is an influential person. This again is okay, but when we still want to talk about leadership over time, we'd really like to get at this idea of persistence. Some individuals, when you have information over time, just like some ideas, are important because they persist. They continue throughout the time periods. Other ones are important because they're coming into power, and still others are losing their power and they're going out of power. 
So we wanted to get at this notion of these kind of gradual shifts or lossy shifts through time. We developed these measures called uh, a high uh, persistence, persistence centrality and emergent centrality, which are time-based metrics that can be used with any of the standard centrality metrics that can be used to look at persistence and emergence. We then said if you're high in both of those, you're basically a persistent and emergent. You're the super strong leader. Whereas if you're just emerging, but you haven't been there for a while, you're not persistent, you're like a rookie, the new kid on the block. And of course, if you are been there for a while, but you're no longer still in power, okay, you're basically retired. And so we wanted to look at the individuals in this way. When you do that, what's very interesting is you find the following background. Now the individuals in green here are high in both. Those are your strong leaders in the area. And your ones that are in blue are the ones that are basically in the retired capability. That is, they're going away, not becoming less important. And the ones in yellow are the emerging ones. What's interesting about this particular chart is, first off, you see that it does have some validation in the sense that Garong, of course, is shown as a retired one, and he's the person who died. Other ones who show up as important across the board are Waqid Muhammad and Ali Al Osnan Al Muhammad, both of whom are extremely important in the uh, development of the Sudan. Whereas other ones who are retiring, and this is my favorite, is Omar Khayyam, and those of you, and if you know, that's actually the famous poet. And he actually shows up as very influential in the Sudan as well. Okay, now let's go on further and look at this area. Not being content with looking at people, when you're looking at revolution, you have to go beyond to not just look at people, but look at their resources, look at the topics of interest, and so on. When we did this, we, the, what you're seeing here is we said, well, we're interested in those things around conflict. What you're seeing here is, um, it's basically like an ego network, but for multi-mode data. What we have here are the several tribes that are heavily invested in the conflict, and they're the shown by the squares. So you've got the Mira, the Dinka, the Noir, the Boar, and so on. And then what we have are the various resources that they are concerned with. So things like uh, the biomes, which is a specialized area of land that's very unique. So if you're living in a biome, you have a very different culture. So these would be like people who live on the top of a mountaintop. Um, then you have, of course, livestock. The one that's absolutely dominant, and the size of the nodes show you here, the absolute dominant resource is livestock, and all of the conflicting tribes are associated with it. We then looked at it in terms of the topics of issues, and what you see here with the same tribes is that very few of them are concerned with peace. Uh, a lot of them are concerned with things like their, a severe conflict, and all of them also are concerned with things like kinship. So from a network perspective, just looking at these things, so far we see that these same tribes that are concerned with, kin with livestock are also the ones that are involved with conflict. Let's go on and look a little bit further at the relationship there. And what we found was that, again, across all the tribes and throughout time, even when you do a lab uh, analysis, that in fact one of the dominant predictors of conflict, severe, severe conflict in the Sudan, was livestock. So those who are concerned and, uh, and their lives are based around livestock are involved in the worst conflicts. Now, we then took this data along with some other things. And so now this is a regression analysis that's done on the on network data, but what we've done is rather than doing it on the network, we can take accounts from it. So we ran one regression to predict peace and one to predict conflict. I'm only showing you the significant results and the strength of the line is the strength of the weighted coefficient. What we find is that the only thing that will predict which of the, which of the tribes were engaged in peace were if they were in their network, the strength of their tie to a biome. If they were in these kind of specialized land areas, then they didn't care about that. Because no one was going to compete with them because they were in a weird geographic lo location. In contrast, all the tribes that were tied to conflict had uh, strong ties to livestock, strong ties to environmental, various environmental terms, and in fact were concerned with lots and lots of different environmental issues. This suggests that conflict in the Sudan is very much a uh, land use, water rights, and potentially a growing issue as we go into fields of climate change from a network perspective. 
Now let's switch gears to the Arab Spring. In the case of the Arab Spring, what we have is we have data for all 18 countries involved or associated with the Arab Spring. We have news data and we have Twitter data. We have news data for each of the countries collected from LexisNexis. We have both English and Arabic, although I haven't processed the Arabic yet. And then we have Twitter data, which is again in several languages. We have over a million documents um, in news data, and we have over four million tw uh, tweets. This data was then run through our system to automatically extract uh, the different individuals, the organizations, the uh, issues of concern and so on to look at this particular issue. Now, I'm, in the case of the Arab Spring, when you look at this, and you look at like what a way of measuring the degree of conflict from this kind of data is to simply say to what extent is conflict high in degree, and similarly to look to what extent that is connected to lots of other issues, lots of people, so etc. And the same for revolution. Using this kind of network data. What we're seeing here is uh, basically um, heat maps. So the darker the color, the stronger the degree. And the stronger the purple, that means the stronger the issue and concerns were with revolution, the stronger the red, the more the concern was with war, civil war, conflict. And what you see here is across the board, there's a low level of concern with revolution and conflict to begin with. The area was absolutely in a conflictual situation. But then you had growing over time, so going down the first column and going down the second, you had a growing interest in revolution, and you saw that going in the case of at least Libya into outright conflict. This spread over time was not geographic, and nor was it despite a lot of popular claims due to Facebook. Another uh, theory that's out there is that as you move into periods of conflict, the number of actors of import in your network will actually decrease. What we have found instead is exactly the opposite. As each of these countries move into out and out revolution, the number of actors of interest, the ones that are high across a large number of variables, actually increases dramatically. What you see here is exactly a one month spread between Egypt and Libya and the first two tallest lines, which show which are exactly timed with um, their revolution. So you had an increase in the number of relevant actors in both countries. You see a similar thing in Tunisia, of course Tunisia being tiny, there's fewer actors. And uh, with Syria though, you do not see the big increase until just recently. We then went through and measured various things about these individuals, and because we're in a conflict situation, we wanted to know who was basically acting as a leader, so we used um, high, between us, uh, high degree for that. We wanted to know who was acting as a gatekeeper, so we used between us minus degree for that. And we wanted to know if the latent leader, these are the individuals, that, these are kind of secondary actors, the ones who might come into power. Now, red here means that they're a member of the incumbent. Blue means they're part of the revolutionaries. Green means they're from some supporting or secondary country that's in the Mideast uh, or in the surrounding area to them. And yellow, of course, are the UN and US um, peacekeeping groups. Um, now what you see here, and we see this in every single country, I'm only going to show you Egypt, is that the uh, primary leader will be the incumbent uh, head. In this case, it's of course Mubrain. And that person will be absolutely stable in that position, at least until the revolution and usually for a period afterwards. The second thing you see is that among the gatekeepers is that they're always a political elite. Oftentimes, uh, they're a newspaper or news elite, uh, video elite sometimes movie stars. So you will get in here um, things like famous TV personalities, news broadcasters, etc. And the reason for that is when you go and look at this information is that what they are doing is they are controlling the flow of information about those countries and that is why they show up. You almost never, and there's like, there's like 19 to 30,000 actors per country here, you almost never see any of the uh, revolutionaries actually show up in the data at least until you get down until about 50% of the way down in the list of the actors. So they do not show up as dominant on any network metric. The one exception we've found so far is, of course, uh, this one per this is person, uh, Mohammed al Baradel, who is extremely outspoken about Egypt even before the revolution. Um, Libya looks very similar again to the same pattern that we saw in Egypt. Now, the next book, so what is there that presages the revolution at all? 
what we find is that the one thing that really presages revolution in every single country is that if you look at the network as a multi-mode system, connecting the people, the organizations, the topics, and so on, immediately preceding the revolution, there is this dramatic increase in uh, the density of the multi-mode network. We, okay, this measure is often referred to, not only, if you don't want to call it a multi-mode density, you can think of it as a measure, of course, of complexity. So you get this increase in complexity, or this increase in number of topics uh, that are inter and it's not just the number of topics, it's the density with which they're connected to each other. The other thing that you can see happening in all of these uh, cases is that as the revolution occurs, and you get this increase in activity and the number of kinds of different uh, things that people are doing right around the time of the revolution. Now people argued that maybe this was due to terrorists and so on. We then looked at the various terror groups that are present in the particular areas. For every single one of them, they have the same pattern to change, the same temporal pattern for the change of their um, network characteristic, in this case, degrees in trial that I'm showing you, uh, over time, over the course of the revolutions. But the one thing that happened, and this was across the board, is that as the revolution peaked, the uh, degree centrality and importance of the terror groups actually decreased. So they kind of went underground for a while, and then they came up again as the revolutions started to, uh, as they changed over to either out and out conflict or to a new regime. We then applied the things to the, con the concepts that didn't have anything to do with new organizations. There's a theory of communication reach that is really a network-based theory that says, look, uh, ideas that you have will have greater reach. I'll be able to, you'll be able to get more impact for a newspaper ad or an ad on a billboard or whatever it is, if in fact you use words that are highly decreasent, highly have high degree centrality. Okay, they're connected to lots of other words. They have high local betweenness. There's a lot of throughput through them because they are evoking and evoking. And of course, they're frequently used. Using these ideas, we then went and analyzed all the concepts and found that, that in the case of the Egyptian revolution, prior to and during the revolution, uh, concepts like religion and international relations became extreme symbols for the way in which people were behaving. And it became increasingly strong as you move toward the revolution. International revolution here, uh, International relations is a standard here for we think the foreigners are trying to tell us what to do. Another thing that became increasingly symbolic were the protests themselves. In contrast, things like economics are just, just buzzwords with no meaning, which is thrown out there, but not really tied to anything and not even really referring to economics most of the time. And the elections were treating, treated as a stereotypical like that. In Libya, the whole dialogue was different. And looking at it from a network linguistic perspective, it was much more violent arguments. Instead of talking about protests, they were talking about war as symbolic. Instead of talking about economics, economics actually reduced in importance as you move from uh, the pre to the post revolution out and out civil war time. And terrorism remained one of their common buzzwords. So it was a much more violent dialogue than it ever was in Egypt. Now, the role of Facebook. Everyone claimed that this was a Facebook revolution. Oh, Twitter was great. They shut off the internet. It must have been the cause. In point of fact, we see no causal factor for, for uh, Facebook. Instead, what we see is that over time, the spread of interest in Facebook did not correspond with the spread of the revolutions. What we do find is that Facebook and Twitter, and social media in general, was very important in erecting a kind of uh, allowing for the, uh, what's called what we would call a leaderless revolution because it was used to actually tell you where and when to meet. But the reason why people went really had to do was because their friends met, went, not their Facebook friends, the people they met on a daily basis. So, and one of the reasons why this is the case, you can see from looking at this, these are various heat maps showing you the uh, usage of things like cell phones, Facebook, internet usage, and literacy. And what you'll notice across the board is that, blue means there's not very much, okay, is that the only place that keeps showing up red is the Emirates, um, as well as uh, sometimes Qatar. They're the only ones with a lot of things. It's, and uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, there's actually um, over two cell phones per person. There's a lot of reasons for that, okay. 
Um, but basically, you don't have a lot of internet, et cetera, activity. What's going on here, and the reason Facebook and Twitter were used at all, was it was a center city phenomenon. Only the, only the members of the, only the members there that had actually been college educated or well educated and had a lot of money and who lived in the city were actually using this. This was not a revolutionary spread out in the fields uh, where a lot of the public is. But, the, but the Twitter did play a certain interesting role. Here we, I'm showing you the data we processed so far from Syria and across the board through time. If you look at the sheer volume, okay, and I'll get back to networks in a moment, but if you look at the sheer volume, there's absolutely no correlation between the sheer volume of Twitter messages and the sheer volume of news messages dealing with the revolution in Syria. It was neither parallel nor predictive in either case. However, if you drill down by topic, so we drilled down on Homs, which was one of the very critical revolutionary events in the case of Syria. Uh, if you drill down by topic and find all the hashtags associated with that and all the news articles associated with the same event, and then you analyze those separately, what you find is precisely a one-day lead from Twitter to uh, newspaper data in terms of announcing the, the, the beginning of the event. Similarly, we can see the same thing in uh, Egypt. If we looked at the Egyptian revolution, if you look at the tweets, um, and a common tweet for uh, the Egyptian revolution was January 25th, is that you would see a one-day lead um, before the peak of the first events announcing the revolution. But the important thing is, is that while the tweets, which are the blue lines there, led the initial announcements in the newspapers, for secondary information, and as the revolution went on and they tried to force Mulgrave to resign, all of the secondary information, the newspapers led the tweets. And, that's, and we're seeing the same thing on a variety of network measures for both the tweets and for the news data at the same time as well. The network measures will lead the news, the news network measure initially, but then the news ones will lead the other. So from a media review of revolution, what we find is that um, if you now look at all of the different topics and if you look at their degree centrality, so that is the extent to which these topics are connected with lots of other topics, and you do a lot of regression on these. What you find is that in fact, in terms of protest, that um, economic news is not important, but what is important is the, is the human rights and how connected the issues of human rights were to everything. And we're also finding increasing role of, of protests again, as the lag view of protests. So we're gonna talk about protests, we're gonna keep talking about it, and we need to talk about human rights. So it's a very interesting view, and the great thing about networks in this case is that it actually let you uncover things about the spread of revolution that weren't possible otherwise. So in summary, uh, what we're suggesting is that if you're looking at networks, it's you need to think about them moving through space and through time. We need some new metrics, and it's important that we keep them simple. So I'm all with Martin on this one. We've got to keep them simple because we've got to use them on these cases where we have millions, in some cases, billions of uh, data points. And in the case of uh, state stability, what we're finding is that it's important to move beyond networks of just people to also look at people and resources, or as I think about it from a journalism perspective, who, what, when, where, how, why. And that the secondary actors are important, the ones to look at. We really need to look at beyond just who's top in our standard degrees, but look at secondary actors as well.
все. Ведь нужно понимать, была болотная, вроде как используя сеть. А потом была поклонная гора, как растить. Uh, 
uh, within my research networks play rather an indirect role. So I'm not interested genuinely in networks as a matter of a study, but rather in their consequences in particular policy fields. So I'm, a, I'm maybe a, I'm not a network scholar in the narrow sense. And this is why maybe I would slightly disagree uh, with regard to my definition of networks because I'm not an expert, but I'm a little bit too careful to speak about a new methodological um, uh, parad or a paradigmatic change. I, would, I, I have the impression that there's a very promising, very fresh, very new perspective. So I would, I would rather be a little bit more careful and wait whether it is from a perspective of, of non-network um, scholar, to be honest. A few preparations and suggestions to understand my position. Now, in politics, there is a big contrast between methodology and ontology. That is, between the methods we use in understanding political reality. И э, вот этот предзаданный взгляд с точки зрения методологии перестает работать. Поэтому э, крен э, в политической науке смещается в сторону ответа на вопрос, что такое политическая реальность. Что такое политическая реальность. И если говорить о тех ответах, которые мы получаем, я говорил об антологии политических сетей, это один из возможных ответов, идущий из определенной э, конструкции размышления об этой проблеме, когда э, соединяется природа общества, да, э, меняются, меняются ориентиры в мышлении и так далее. Вот если синергетика может быть включена, это реальность, это не подход. Именно когда он стал реальностью, я сказал, когда сети вышли в действие. Когда они стали действовать, а не когда они были просто некоторые структуры.